Um, I would like to start um, uh, introducing uh, our speaker tonight. Um, uh, before I do, uh, first I do want to thank um, our pastor, Father John, our, um, our youth ministry group, our youth ministry director, Kathy Colrust, and all the uh, volunteers from the youth group, students and parents who have come tonight to make this uh, dinner possible and make it, make it work for us. So thank all of you very much over there. Thank you all for coming. I think there are over 80 of you here tonight. And uh, those of us board members who were planning the meeting placed bets with each other on how many there would be. And our secretary, Wes, guessed 83. And I think at your last count, there were 83. So, good job. Uh, thank you all for coming from near and from afar, and I now owe Wes a beer. Uh, my name is Chris Lee. I am uh, president, somehow, of the chapter, New Mexico chapter of the Society of Catholic Scientists, uh, which was founded in 2016. And we're very, very honored to have the founding president of the society here tonight, uh, Stephen Barr. Uh, Steve, um, well, before I do the formal introduction, I want to mention my personal connection is that I met Steve uh, at a international physics conference on supersymmetry in 2008 in Seoul, Korea, uh, where we were both attending. And I was introduced to him by our mutual friend and colleague, uh, Xavier Calme, another theoretical physicist. and. Um, Steve uh, wanted to know where he could go to Mass on Sunday in Seoul. So I gave him directions to the beautiful Myeongdong Cathedral of Seoul so he could go to Sunday Mass. And he was also compiling a list of all the Catholics in physics uh, that he, he could find, if I remember correctly. And I, I, I got on his list. And I didn't know what he was going to do with the list. Uh, honestly, I was afraid that oh, when the uh, persecution of Christians starts again and they find the list, well, I'm, <laughs> they know where to find us. But uh, in 20, by 2016, um, I think that that list grew and it turned into a mailing list to, to, to get interest in the Society of Catholic Scientists and an announcement of the first annual conference of the SCS, which happened in Chicago in 2017, and with the exception of 2020, for obvious reasons, that annual conference has happened uh, every year since then. Um, the SCS has grown now to, um, I counted in the directory, uh, about, around 1,500 members, almost. around almost 1,600 around the whole world. Um, 35 of us are here in New Mexico and members of the New Mexico chapter. <coughs> That is the 12th largest uh, number by uh, SES members by state in the US, uh, which is pretty good for, for New Mexico. And um, we're right in between Michigan and New Jersey. But Steve, uh, Steve is a phys uh, particle physicist. He is professor emeritus at the University of Delaware and was director of its Bartol Research Institute. Uh, he, in 2011, he was elected fellow of the American Physical Society for his original contributions to grand unified theories, CP violation, and baryogenesis, which is related to the origin of matter and the matter antimatter asymmetry in the universe. Uh, he has a number of things named for him in physics, which is a remark, which is a very uh, great accomplishment. Uh, the bar Z contribution to the electric dipole moments of electrons and neutrons the nelson Barr mechanism uh, as a solution to the strong CP problem, which is also related to matter antimatter asymmetry. He received his PhD from Princeton in 1978. He did postdoctoral research at the University of Pennsylvania, the University of Washington, and was an associate scientist at Brookhaven National Laboratory before joining the University of Delaware in 1987. It's really convenient when you're famous enough that Wikipedia has a whole article on you. <laughs> Um, and your greatest accomplishment in life is if in, in Wikipedia it says you are a practicing Catholic. So, and he writes and lectures frequently on the relation of science and religion. 
He's on the uh, editorial board of First Things, uh, has written in many publications. He has published several books, including Modern Physics and Ancient Faith, uh, Science and Religion, The Myth of Conflict, and The Believing Scientist, Essays on Science and Religion, which you should all order, and he did not pay me to say that. Um, in 2007, he was awarded the Ben Emerenti Medal by Pope Benedict XVI, which is pretty cool, and was elected a member of the Academy of Catholic Theology in 2010. Uh, he is married to Kathleen Barr, and they have five children. And as I mentioned, he is the president and the founder of the Society of Catholic Scientists, and it is a distinct honor of the New Mexico chapter to have our founder and president uh, here to tell us today about science and religion, the myth of conflict. Before I begin, uh, how many people, how many people here know who that clerical gentleman is standing next to Einstein? Raise your hand if you don't. Know oh, good. A lot of people know. But if you don't, at least that's one thing you learn from my talk. Uh, so many people think there's a conflict between uh, science and religion. I'm, I'm sure that you're all aware of that, and that's probably one reason why you came to hear this talk. Now, when people find out that I am a uh, scientist and a religious believer, uh, I'm sometimes asked whether I find, uh, how do I reconcile those uh, two things? Do I find difficulty reconciling? And I've always found that a, a, a strange question. Um, because in many ways, the, the same things that make me a Catholic make me a scientist, I, a belief First, a sense of wonder, first of all. Um, a passionate desire to know the reason behind things. And a sense that everything ultimately holds together in some coherent way. So for me, and I think all the Catholic scientists who I know, both the Catholic faith and empirical science make sense of the Science tells us about the things that we can observe and measure. Whereas our faith has a much wider scope and answers uh, deeper questions. Questions about the ultimate cause of the universe's existence and order. Uh, the purpose of human life and our ultimate destiny. It tells us about spiritual realities. About God and man, love and truth, good and evil, sin and redemption. So the Catholic faith and empirical science are indeed two different perspectives on reality. But while they're different, they're not conflicting. I've been a scientist for 43 years and a Catholic for 67 years. And I know of no scientific fact that conflicts with any Catholic doctrine. So why do so many people think there is a conflict between science and religion. Now one reason is that a lot of people lump all religion together. It, and any example, therefore, of any superstitious belief or belief or magical practice they come across, they, that's evidence to them of the irrationality of all religion. Also, many people have misconceptions about what science tells us about the world, what it's discovered, or misconceptions about what various religions teach. Even many Catholics are not really, don't really have an accurate understanding of some of the teachings of, of their own faith. But another <clears throat> reason is that many fail to see the distinction between science itself and a certain philosophy that's often called scientific materialism. Now, what is scientific what is scientific materialism? Well, materialism is the philosophical idea that all of reality excuse me, is reducible to matter and its behavior. Scientific materialists are people who think that materialism is somehow implied by modern science. This is an opinion that is held by many scientists and by many people who claim to speak in the name of science. But it has no claim to being science. It is, as I said, a philosophical opinion. Now, if matter were the only real 
reality, then of course God would not exist. Because God is not a material entity, nor would human spiritual souls. A human being would be, in the final analysis, nothing but a complex structure made of atoms. And everything about a human being would be explicable, ultimately, in terms of the laws of physics that govern how those atoms move. In other words, scientific materialism doesn't just imply that God does not exist. It implies that you don't exist, at least not in the way that you thought you did. So for example, the popular astronomer and uh, popular science writer, uh, Carl Sagan, uh, put it this way in one of his books. I am a collection of water, calcium, and organic molecules called Carl Sagan. And Francis Crick, a co-discoverer of DNA, in one of his books, wrote, you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will, are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. As Lewis Carroll's Alice might have phrased it, you're nothing but a pack of neurons. <laughs> now, for some of its adherents, I'm going to go to a blank slide so you won't keep reading that over and over. <laughs> now, for some of its adherents, uh, scientific materialism is more than just a philosophy. It's a passionately held ideology that sees science as having a saving mission and that mission is to free the human mind from irrationality and superstition, with, among which they count religion. For such people, it's not enough that science is good and brings us greater understanding of the world. There must be an enemy to be vanquished. And they cast, as for all ideologies, and that, that they cast religion in that role. And I think this explains the strange zeal that some materialists, like Richard Dawkins, for example, have in propagating their ideas. They feel they're taking part in a grand struggle between reason and its enemies. Science represents reason, and religion represents the enemies of reason. Now, scientific materialists have a well-developed critique of religion which has at least three aspects, philosophical, historical, and scientific. Now, the philosophical claim is that there is an inherent contradiction between the scientific and religious outlooks, apart from anything science has actually discovered. The very outlooks are antithetical to each other. Science is based on reason and evidence, whereas religion, they say, is irrational because it is based on dogma, faith, and mystery, which involve belief in things that cannot be seen, and for which supposedly there is no evidence. Science is based on natural explanations of natural phenomena and natural laws, whereas religion is based on miracles and, and the supernatural. They see religion as a matter of myth and magic, and therefore the very antithesis of a rational scientific outcome. Their historical claim is that religious believers and institutions have been hostile to science and have tried to suppress it. This is powerfully symbolized in the eyes of many people by the church's treatment of Galileo 400 years ago. And this impression is constantly being reinforced in the public mind by the ongoing battles waged against evolution by fundamentalist Christians. The materialist scientific claim is that the actual discoveries of modern science over the last 400 years have debunked or undermined basic Christian beliefs about the universe and our place in as the story is often told, and this is a story I grew up on as a kid, 
Science has dealt one blow after another to the religious conception of the world. Copernicus showed that we're not at the center of the universe. Newtonian physics showed that nature has no purposes or goals, but is governed is purely mechanical and is governed by blind and impersonal forces. Modern astronomy showed how small and seemingly insignificant we are compared to the cosmos as a whole. Darwin, some say, showed that human life is an accident and that human beings differ only in degree, not in kind, from lower animals. Advances in neuroscience and artificial intelligence are thought to be demonstrating that the supposed soul is nothing but the working of the brain, a complex biochemical computer. And modern cosmology is invoked to show either that the world had no beginning or that the universe created itself out of nothing by a quantum fluctuation. So in this talk, I'm going to focus primarily on the materialist, philosophical, and historical claim that some religion and Christianity in particular are inherently contrary to science and historically have been its enemies. In the last part, to the extent the time allows, I'll discuss some of the things that modern physics has discovered about the world and argue that they're more consonant with what Catholics believe than with materialism and atheism. So let me begin with the supposed opposition between the supernaturalism of biblical religion and the naturalism of science. Now, Christianity and Judaism were never based on supernaturalism, if we mean by that a rejection of the idea that there is a natural order, a natural world. In fact, scholars tell us that the book of Genesis was, to a large extent, an attack on the supernaturalism superstition of ancient pagan religion. So when Genesis said that the sun and moon were merely lights or lamps placed by God in the heavens to light the day and the night, Genesis was attacking the paganism that worshipped the sun and moon as gods. And when it said that man is made in the image of God and was to exercise dominion or stewardship over the animals, Genesis was, among other things, attacking the paganism in which human beings bowed down to and worshipped animals, or to gods made in the image of animals. In paganism, the world was filled with occult forces, populated by numerous deities, gods of the oceans, and gods and goddesses of the oceans and forests, of wind and fire, of lightning, of sex and fertility, and so on. But Jews and Christians taught that there was but one God who was not to be sought within nature and its phenomena and forces, but a God who was outside of nature, a God who indeed is the author of nature. So in this way, biblical religion stripped the physical universe of divinity and made it into a natural world, no longer the abode of gods, but the creation of the one God. And since God is good, the natural world was seen as something good and worth studying. And since God is intelligent and wise, the world he made must reflect this and be governed, and must therefore have been made according to principles and laws that are discoverable by and understandable by reason. So biblical religion taught that there is a natural order which comes from God. And what characterizes this natural order and reflects the rationality of its creator is precisely that it is orderly, harmonious, beautiful, and lawful. Consider this passage from the letter of Clement, St. Clement to the church of Corinth, written around 97 AD. St. Clement was a bishop of Rome and listed in ancient chronologies as the third bishop of Rome after 
St. Peter, the third Pope after St. Peter. So here's a small excerpt. Oops, go here's a small excerpt from his letter to the church in Corinth. The heavens, as they revolve beneath his government, do so in quiet submission to him. The day and the night run the course he has laid down for them. Sun, moon, and starry choirs roll on in harmony at his command, none swerving from his appointed orbit. Laws of the same kind sustain the fathomless deeps of the abyss and the untold regions of the netherworld. The impassable ocean and all the worlds that lie beyond it by themselves ruled by the like ordinances of the Lord. Upon all of these, the great architect and Lord of the universe has enjoined peace and harmony. Or consider this passage, it's one of my favorites, from the Latin Christian author Minucius Felix, writing around 200 AD. This was in a book he wrote convince his pagan contemporaries to believe in a creator God. And he says, if upon entering some home, you saw that everything there was well tended, neat, and decorative, you would believe that some master was in charge of it, and that he was himself much superior to those good things. So too in the home of this world, when you see providence, order, and law in the heavens, on earth. Believe that there is a Lord and author of the universe more beautiful than the stars themselves and the various parts of the whole world. Now look at what these ancient passages point to as evidence of God. Not the supernatural phenomena or miraculous departure from the order of nature, but to the order of nature itself and its lawfulness. The ancient argument was that if there is a law, there must be a lawgiver. God was the lawgiver not only to Israel, but to the cosmos itself. In Jeremiah 33, 25, God says, When I have no covenant with day and night, and have given no laws to heaven and earth, then too will I reject the descendants of Jacob and of my servant David, all in his laws we have on earth. Psalm 148 tells of God establishing the sun, the moon, the stars, and the heavens by a decree or ordinance or law. The idea of God as a rational lawgiver helped indeed to give birth to the very idea that there are laws of nature. The idea of laws of physics, where does the idea of laws of physics come from? Well, historians tell us it comes from the 17th century, and specifically from Descartes and Newton. And both Descartes and Newton postulated the idea of laws of nature, which they conceived of as mathematical laws, because of the fact that God who created the universe, and God gave the laws to them. So the very idea of laws of physics historically is rooted in the Christian belief that the universe was created by a rational model. And this is something that even some atheists at times see. For example, Edward O. Wilson, the eminent Harvard biologist, uh, who sometimes calls himself an agnostic, but I think it's clear he's an atheist, he suggested uh, the following in one of his books as the reason why various ancient civilizations had never come up with a Newton or a Descartes. And he said, why didn't they come up with a have a produce a Newton or a Descartes? And he said, these civilizations had abandoned the idea of a supreme being with personal and creative properties. No rational author of nature existed for them. Consequently, the objects they meticulously described did not follow universal principles. In the absence of a compelling need for the notion of general laws, thoughts in the mind of God, so to speak, little or no search was made for them. He was right about this. This is, as I said, atheist sentence. Now, our faith does teach, of course, that there are supernatural realities, such as divine grace, that have effects in the world. But the very word supernatural, which is a technical term in Catholic theology, means beyond, above the natural. It would make no, have no meaning unless there were a natural order to begin with. 
And the idea of miracles, the concept of miracles, which are extraordinary events that go beyond what is naturally possible, presupposes that there is a natural order that determines what is naturally possible and what isn't. There's no logical contradiction between the idea of a lawful universe and the idea of miracles. For the same lawgiver who established the laws of nature can also suspend them uh, in, and make exceptions to them for the sake of some greater purpose. And for Christians and Jews, the greater purpose, which moves God at times to suspend the laws of nature, have things happen and contravene them, is the salvation of human beings, salvation of souls. And as we'll see, the people who led the development of modern science in its first few centuries, the, the pioneers in uncovering nature's laws, were almost all, virtually all, uh, devout Christians who believed in miracles, such as Isaac Newton, for example. Now, there's a lot of confusion today, even among religious believers, about how God relates to nature. Instead of seeing God as the author of nature, which is the traditional view, they see God and nature as either opposed or in competition with each other. So if something has a natural explanation, then God has nothing to do with it. But if God is the cause of something, then it must be supernatural. And so they think that the place to look for evidence of God, the only place to look for evidence of God, is in what is outside the course of nature or inexplicable by science. That is in the gaps in our scientific understanding of the world. And that, and hence the expression of the God of the gaps. And atheists think that by closing those gaps in our understanding that God will have no place left to hide. Now, as I said, the traditional view, this Christian view, is quite different. If God, as the creator of the natural world, established its laws and gave things their natural powers, then his existence is evident in nature itself and its ordinary processes, as well as in miraculous ones. This is the message of the following passage from the Book of Wisdom, a Jewish work of about the 50 BC, part of the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox Old Testament part of the Old Testament of the early church, I should have. And uh, it is actually the only passage in Scripture which is directly, in a sense, directed at scientists. And it's chapter 13 in the Book of Wisdom. Chapter 13, in verses 1 to 9. So I'll quote part of it. Well, here it is, God versus nature. That's the great misconception. It's God versus nature. So the Book of Wisdom says, for all people, and it, this was addressed, it was written in about 50 BC, and Jews were coming into contact with the fall of ancient Greece and the works of the philosophers and scientists of ancient Greece. And so it's talking about all people, it's talking about pagan philosophers. For all people who are ignorant of God were foolish by nature, and they were unable from the good things that are seen to know the one who exists, nor did they recognize the partisan while paying heed to his works. But they suppose that either fire or wind or swift air or the circle of the stars or turbulent water or the lights in the heavens were the gods that rule the world. If through delight in the beauty of these things people assume them to be gods, let them know how much better than these is their Lord for the author of beauty created them. And if people were amazed at their power of working, let them perceive from them how much more powerful is the one who formed them. For from the greatness and beauty of created things comes a corresponding perception of their creator. Actually, it goes on very interestingly to talk about scientists, but I'm not going to in, in, in a kind of appreciative way. Now notice that the evidence of God to which this scriptural passage points consists of phenomena and processes that are perfectly natural. Fire, wind, swift air, the circle of the stars, turbulent water, and the lights in the heavens. That, those are the evidence for God that this scriptural law will point to. Now, medieval uh, theologians, 
distinguish two ways in which God acts in the world. And it goes back to being before the Middle Ages. It, he, can, he can act directly in a supernatural manner, as, for example, turning water into wine. Uh, or he can accomplish his will through the operation of natural causes and processes, which in the terminology and the theology are called secondary causes. God is the primary cause. It's always been the Christian view that God ordinarily acts in a latter way through the natural. In the words of the scholastic theologian about 400 years ago, Francisco Suarez, quote, God does not interfere directly with the natural order where secondary causes suffice to produce the intended effect. Now this principle was important in the founding of science, for it implied that when confronted by some puzzling event or new phenomenon, we should look first for natural explanation. Superstitious people tend to see the supernatural in every unusual or strange event, but this was criticized by the great medieval scientist theologian Nicholas Oresp, who's actually also a bishop, in addition to being a scientist and genius. In explaining the marvels of nature, Oresp said, quote, there is no reason to take recourse to the heavens, or to demons, or to our glorious God, as if he would produce these effects directly, any more than he directly produces those effects whose natural causes, we believe, are well known to us. Another great medieval scientist and philosopher, Jean Buridan, wrote, quote, the philosophers, and that in those days included scientists, the philosophers explain such marvels by appropriate natural causes. The not, but common folk, not knowing of causes, believe these phenomena are produced by a miracle of God, which is usually not true. In other words, we should first seek appropriate natural causes rather than jumping to the conclusion that something is a miracle. And that's why the Catholic Church, in its canonization process, does not declare a miracle worthy of belief until it has first excluded the likelihood of natural explanation. Now this brings us back to the very important, crucial theological distinction between primary and secondary causality. I, I believe that it is the failure to understand this distinction that is at the root of much of the, I believe, that science and religion are conflict. I think this distinction is most simply explained by a simple analogy. And by using, perhaps, the terms of vertical and horizontal rather than primary and secondary cause. The analogy is to a novel or a play. Take the play Hammond, which I read when I was in high school. I don't think I've read it since, but I really it. But I think I maybe have. Now, in the play Hamlet, the character Hamlet <coughs> kills the character Polonius by stabbing him through a curtain. So consider the following question. And sometimes I ask people to vote. Did Polonius die? because Hamlet stabbed him through a curtain? Or did Polonius die because Shakespeare wrote the play that way? And of course, it's an absurd question. And I, when I had to gave this talk in Chicago, I said, people had people raise their hands, and I said, it's Chicago, you can vote twice. <laughs> so, and, and you should, because they're both, they're both the causes. But causes in a different way. Hamlet is the cause within the play, within the plot of the play, of Polonius' death. The horizontal cause. Whereas Shakespeare is the vertical cause. He's the cause of the entire play. He is the cause of there being a play at all. Of it having the characters in it and the events in it that it does. Of those events, all of the relationships among those characters and events, including the causal relationships among them. So it's the cause of the whole shebang. And obviously that doesn't, it's not in competition with the fact that Hamlet stabbing Polonius caused his death within the plot. Now by analogy, the natural causes within the universe, which are studied by everybody, including natural scientists, are horizontal or secondary causes. And the words in 
terminology and theology. But God is the author of nature, is the vertical or primary cause. The analogy makes clear how silly it is to treat, for example, evolution and creation as alternatives. Did this species of animal, let's say hippopotamus or, or, or giraffe, did it arise through a sequence of natural causes within the plot of the universe? Or because God wrote the script of the universe that way? Both. And that's always been the Catholic view. Now this also makes clear why scientific materialists are wrong to think that we believe without evidence. Now if you're a materialist, it's the only matter exists. Evidence consists either of observing something directly with your senses or inferring the existence of something as the natural cause of what you're sensing. So you directly see a compass needle move. But, and then you infer that there's something that you don't see, which you call a magnetic field, which is the natural cause of the compass needle. But obviously, God cannot be seen or uh, have evidence in either of those ways because God is not a part of the natural world, which we can sense is not a material or physical entity, nor is he the natural cause. He is not a natural cause within the universe, like the magnetic field. He is not a cause within nature. He is the cause of nature. And so nature gives evidence of God in the same way that a book gives evidence of his author, even if the author does not appear in the pages of the book. And the way a, a musical, a symphony, gives evidence of its composer, even though the composer is not there among the notes. So that's the end of the first part of my talk, which is a, a philosophical uh, claim, the philosophical claims. Materials, atheists. What time did we start? Uh, was it Chris? What time did we start, Chris? We started about 7:20. 7:20. I just want to know how to calibrate the rest of the talk. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about the historical critique. Now the idea that Christianity and, and the Catholic Church, in particular, perhaps, opposed science and tried to hold it back. Um, is called by historians of science the conflict thesis or the warfare thesis. It has been rejected. It was believed by many historians of science for a long time. But it's now rejected universally by scientists, historians of science as a relatively recent invention. In fact, this myth really dates from the late 19th century, the latter part of the 19th century, and is largely the creation of two amateur and rather incompetent historians. They're not historians by trade, but they, they're amateur. So, uh, Andrew Dixon White and I think John William Draper. And each of them wrote a book with a title that was something like The Warfare Between Science and Religion in Christian. Very similar titles. And much of and they their books are now rejected by historians as largely filled with factual errors, gross errors of interpretation. Um, and, uh, and the whole thesis is regarded as, as completely false. The idea that there are two, there were historically two moral camps, the religion camp and the science camp, is ridiculous because from early, from the beginnings of modern science up until the right, mid-19th century, there were really not two camps. Virtually everyone in the scientific camp was religious. There were not two separate sets of people. So if we consider, for example, the great figures of the scientific revolution, there are many of them, but virtually all of them were devout Christians. The scientific revolution really was sparked by Copernicus in the 15th and the 16th century. And the century of the scientific revolution was the 17th century. 
And virtually all the great figures in science in, in, in that time were themselves devout Christians. I'm just going to list some of the biggest names. Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Descartes, Pascal, Boyle, and Newton. I can list many more. So, Copernicus was an official of the Catholic Church. He was a canon of Frauenberg Cathedral. Um, Johannes Kepler was a devout Lutheran. And if you look at his treatise, I take it out of the library, his great treatise, half of it's prayers and, and religious meditations, and the other half is, is astronomy. And he it, what, what, it's one of the prayers of his great treatise in which he announced his three laws of planetary motion. I thank you, Lord God, our creator, that you have allowed me to see the beauty in your work of creation. That was the attitude of scientists for a long time. Galileo, despite his troubles with the church authorities, remained a devout Catholic throughout his life by all evidence. Descartes believed in God and that human beings possess an immaterial spiritual, immaterial spiritual souls and professed himself an Orthodox Catholic. The modern historians try to drive a wedge between him and the church. Descartes always proclaimed himself a Catholic. He certainly believed in God and in the soul. Blaise Pascal was not only a mathematician, a physicist, a genius, but he was a man who had a, whose life had been transformed by a profound mystical experience, and who wrote in eloquent defense of Christian faith against religious skepticism. Robert Boyle, the first modern chemist and considered the founder of chemistry, was a pious Anglican who said that Sunday was the most appropriate day to do scientific experiments, as they were a form of worship. <laughs> and, Isaac, and he left a large sum of money at his death to endow a lecture series whose purpose was to combat, as he put it, notorious infidels, which meant people who did not believe in God. Isaac Newton, the greatest of them all, spent as much time on theological and scriptural studies as he did on science. All of them saw their work as showing the beauty of God's creation rather than as supporting atheism. And this was true well beyond the 17th century. For example, most physicists would tell you that the two greatest physicists of the 19th century were Michael Faraday and James Clark Maxwell, both deeply devout Protestants. So, now the scientific revolution did not spring from thin air. Its foundations were laid in the Middle Ages in the universities. Universities were a creation, an invention of the Middle Ages. And uh, this, it was in these medieval universities, which were Catholic institutions, that for the first time in human history, the study of science was institutionalized, in the words of the famous historian of science, Edward Grant, who was not, I should say, Catholic, I don't believe he was religious at all. By the end of the Middle Ages, there were about 100 universities. And it was in those universities that science, which was called in those days natural philosophy, was studied continuously from generation to generation by a stable community of scholars. And those universities produced thousands, tens of thousands of graduates who were introduced in them to the study of the natural world and from whose ranks scientific talent could emerge. Many of the great figures of the scientific revolution were educated in universities that had been founded in the Middle Ages. Now, a little known fact that dramatically illustrates the positive role the Catholic Church has played in the development of science is the large number of Catholic priests who made major discoveries. I'm not just talking about priests who were scientists, but priests who made major breakthroughs in science. And I'm only going to mention some of the most outstanding. So from the 17th century, I'll mention, well, I'll first mention, I'll mention Stenson, or Steno, Mersenne, Shiner, Riccioli, Grimaldi, Cavalieri, and Castelli. Now, Neil Stenson, who was Danish by birth, uh, was generally known by his Latinized form of his name, Steno, is famous in three branches of science, anatomy, crystallography, and geology. The greatest, he was the greatest anatomist of his time and made several major discoveries about the glandular and lymphatic system, as well as about the heart and the brain. In 
in fact, there's a number of things named after him. I was told by someone who went to medical school that you'll learn an anatomy class about Stenson's duct and Stenson's vein and Stenson's foramina and all these things named after him. But his greatest contribution was founding the science of geology, which unlocked, in particular, the theory of sedimentary rocks and the origin of fossils, which unlocked the history of the Earth. And as I said, he is regarded as one of the principal founders of the science of geology. Now, eventually, he left. He was a convert. As an adult, he converted to Catholicism from his Luther, from Lutheranism, and um, eventually became a priest and was made a bishop. And uh, he was known for his rigorous asceticism and concern for the poor. He was declared blessed Nicholas Steno by Pope. St. John Paul II. Marin Mersen. Marin Mersen was a friar of the Minimite order, again in the 1600s. He's considered the founder of the science of acoustics. He was the first person to measure the speed of sound, for example. He made fundamental discoveries about sound and vibrations. He also made important contributions to the theory and design of reflecting telescopes. His religious house became a meeting place of famous scientists such as Pascal, Descartes, and others, descending. In fact, in those days, the way the scientists learned of each other's work, they didn't have scientific conferences, they didn't have scientific journals, they didn't have the internet. The way they learned was largely through correspondence. And the hub, the center of the correspondence, scientific correspondence in continental Europe was percent. And so he was called by the Dictionary of Scientific Biography the, one of the architect, quote, architects of the European scientific community. Christoph Scheiner, well, there's a picture of him uh, in his observatory. He was a Jesuit astronomer, was one of the discoverers of sunspots, in, in, along with Galileo. There were four or five people who independently at the same time discovered sunspots with telescopes. And he made the most detailed study of them. There's a nice diagram. It's a book on his treatise on sunspots. Uh, he also, oh, so the next person is also a Jesuit astronomer, Giovanni Battista Riccioli. He, he actually is very interesting because he discovered and discussed in detail what we nowadays call the Coriolis effect. The Coriolis effect is named after a scientist in the 19th century named Coriolis, who was also himself a believing and practicing Catholic. But actually, 200 years earlier, Riccioli in his works discussed the Coriolis effect. Of course, he was before Newton, so it wasn't as mathematically detailed. Uh, but he also made extensive star catalogs, which became standard uh, reference work at that time. With, uh, he mapped the moon's surface. He developed methods for measuring time precisely, experiments with pendulums, and he made the first accurate measurement of the acceleration of gravity on the surface of the Earth, the G. One of his co-workers, another um, Jesuit scientist, Francesco Grimaldi, discovered the phenomenon of diffraction. And uh, as many of you are scientists, for those of you who aren't, diffraction is a very central phenomenon in physics. You will learn it in your freshman physics textbook. College will be in many of your textbooks when you're a graduate student. It shows the wave-like nature of light. Uh, and he discovered it in the 1600s. He also the one who called it diffraction, did very careful measurements and observations of it. Um, I didn't just discover it, he did very careful studies of it. Uh, the Benedictine priest Benedetto Castelli was one of the founders of uh, hydraulics. And uh, his, he had two very famous, he was a student of uh, Galileo, and he had two famous students of his own, Torricelli. Uh, discovered the principle of the barometer, and the next person is also a student of Castelli, the priest uh, Bonaventura Cavalieri, who was helped to found integral calculus by what he called his method of indivisibles. Uh, he, like the calculus was developed or invented by, or discovered by independently and at the same time by Newton and Leibniz. And Leibniz himself quotes, says the following about uh, in the sublimest of geometry, the initiators and promoters 
who performed a yeoman's task for Cavalieri and Torricelli. Later, others, meaning himself, progressed even further using their words. Lazzaro Spallanzani was considered one of the top biologists of the 18th century, and he, he did more things than I have time to talk about. The founder of crystallography is considered to be the French priest of the OE. He developed a theory, just before Adams was known to exist, he developed a theory of crystals and, and how to, why they had the angles that they do based on an atomic theory of, of crystals. He's the first uh, asteroid was discovered by an Italian priest, Father Giuseppe Piazzi. He discovered Ceres, which is now considered a planet, a dwarf planet, on the same stat status as Pluto. Actually, when, when uh, Piazzi discovered it in 1801, he, it was regarded as a planet. Later, it, got, it became demoted and regarded as an asteroid, but that more recently it's been reclassified again as a planet. So that was uh, the first asteroid, if you will, or the first one of the main bodies in the solar system, Ceres, was discovered by a an Italian astronomer priest. One of the founders of modern astrophysics was Angelo Secchi. I learned about him first in one of my astrophysics colleagues. Apparently all astrophysicists know about Secchi. What differentiates astronomy from astrophysics, essentially, is astronomy is not the study of where things are in the heavens and when you know where they observe to be. Whereas astrophysics probes what are these things made of, what are the physical processes that cause them to get light, and so forth and so on, what, how do they form them. One of the main tools in astrophysics is spectroscopy. And one of the pioneers in spectroscopy was Angelo, the, the pioneer of, of using spectroscopy to study stars and the sun was Angelo, the Jesuit priest, Father Giuseppe Piazzi. And a very nice symbol. And he developed the first uh, spectroscopic classification of stars, which is the basis of the one that's used today. And one of the nice symbols of his, of the harmony between faith and science, is he did his groundbreaking work using a telescope that he had built on the roof of a beautiful church in Rome called the Church of St. Ignatius. It's, that telescope was later stolen by the Italian government, uh, which was at that time anti-clerical. And when he died, they, 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 they took the telescope for themselves. Um, one of the great mathematicians of the 19th century was Bernard Bolzano, the one who studied advanced math. The, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy called him one of the, called him the greatest logician in the period from Leibniz to Frege, which is a 200-year period. So he's one of the great names in mathematics history, and he was a, pre, a Czech priest. Of course, genetics was founded by Gregor Mendel, an Augustinian monk. For those of for Notre Dame fans, uh, Julius Newland, the chemistry professor at Notre Dame in the early 20th century, did work that led to the development of the first synthetic rubber, neoprene. And last but not least is the person who started with, Georges Lemaitre. Georges Lemaitre was a Belgian priest. He is considered the founder of the Big Bang Theory. He was a, he was a theoretical physicist and mathematician, and based on, uh, partly on Einstein's theory Gravity, he found solutions of Einstein's theory of gravity that described the expanded universe. And it was the first to really understand that these solutions to the equations described the universe with space itself as expanded. And then combining that with what he knew astro uh, uh, astronomers were seeing about the uh, distant galaxies receding from us, he postulated that the universe is indeed expanding from an initial explosion that he called the primeval atom is what we now call the Big Bang. So he is the founder of the Big Bang here. So I wanted to go through that. By, by the way, on the website of the Society of Catholic Scientists are biographies of 91 important Catholic scientists in the past. All of them have made important breakthroughs, and all of them on, that, on the website part were believing practicing Catholics. And so we have biographies, short three or four hundred word biographies of 91 such people. The very well-known historian of science, uh, Professor Lawrence Principe of Johns Hopkins University, has written, quote, the Catholic Church has been probably the largest single and 
longest term patron of science in history. So now, in the few minutes I have remaining, how long am I supposed to speak? An hour? I have 15 minutes if I have an hour totally to talk a little bit of, I won't talk about Galileo, but that's an interesting topic. I want to get to the science. I want, to, in the last 15 minutes, I'd like to talk about several major discoveries in the 20th century, in, in particular in physics, that seem more in line with the Christian view of the world than with materialism and atheism. Now, if you want to know more about these, I refer you to my book, Modern Physics and Ancient Faith. And also in the q and I like to take questions, especially about science. Uh, one discovery has to do with the beginning of the universe. The Jewish and Christian view was that the universe had a temporal beginning, a finite age. By contrast, the pagan philosophers of antiquity, including Aristotle, believed that the universe had always existed for infinite time. And most modern atheists seem to have to prefer that view also, that the universe has no beginning. As of a hundred years ago, the scientific evidence seemed, almost all of the scientific evidence seemed to point to the universe having no beginning. And, and many people came to regard the idea of a beginning as a relic of religious mythology. But now we know that George Burnett's idea of a Big Bang was correct. There was a Big Bang about 14 billion years ago. Now, in the standard theory of cosmology, that was the beginning of the universe and of time itself. But it, it, is, you know, it is possible, it's conceivable, that something existed before the Big Bang, so that it wasn't actually the, all, the real beginning of the universe. But even if that is the case, there are strong scientific arguments that favor the, the uh, universe having had a beginning at some point in finite time in the past either the Big Bang or at some earlier time. But the weight of argument favors a universe that has a finite age. A second discovery has to do with our place in the universe. Now, for a long time, atheists have said that the evidence points to human beings being just a cosmic accident, a fluke, in a universe that is totally without purpose. But over the last few decades, physicists have become increasingly aware of many features of the fundamental laws of physics and the structure of the universe that seem to be just right to make the existence of life possible. If certain things had been even slightly different about the laws of physics, then we wouldn't be here. These fortuitous features are often called anthropic coincidences. They suggest, they suggest to many people that we aren't an accident and that the universe does have a purpose, namely that beings, living things, and beings such as ourselves should arise in it. And I can give many examples of such anthropic coincidences. One, a very famous one concerns the strength of the strong force that holds the nuclei together. If that were somewhat weaker, say 20% weaker than it is, it wouldn't hold together a very crucial nucleus called deuterium which is an essential stepping stone in the processes by which all the heavier elements were produced in the early universe and in stars and other astrophysical processes. And there wouldn't be any elements heavier than hydrogen. Hydrogen would be the only element, and you can't make light with just hydrogen. If the strong force was stronger by a few percent, other dramatic differences, things happen, it's not clear whether life would be possible or not. But certainly the world would be radically different uh, if the strong force would be a little bit stronger. Uh, another famous example is in the carbon-12 is the process by which almost all the carbon in the universe is made, and it's a nuclear reaction in which three helium nuclei, three alpha particles, come together virtually simultaneously in a three-way collision and fuse to make carbon-12. That's called the three alpha process. As you can imagine, having three things come together virtually at the same instant is very unlikely. And it turns out the only reason that process was able to generate as much carbon as it has in the universe is because of a very fortuitous feature of the carbon-12 nucleus. It has an excited state at exactly the right energy to 
resonantly enhance that process if that, if that energy level were different by a few percent direction. There would be very little carbon or elements heavier than carbon in the universe. Other examples, well, I, the fact that the world has three large space dimensions is very important. Things, very dramatic things that happened and would be typically bad for life. If we had more than three space dimensions, I'm talking about extended ones, macroscopic space dimensions. If there are more than three, then, then gravity would not depend on the inverse square law, it would depend on distance by a different power. And it's easy to see, it's a simple homework problem to show that you can't have stable orbits of planets around stars in more than three dimensions. In less than three dimensions, other terrible things happen. So we're very lucky that there are three dimensions. The fact that the world is quantum mechanical is extremely important also. Anyway, but there are many, many, th by the way, this was something that people fought against tooth and nail for a long time. Scientists would just dismiss this idea that there were features of the laws of physics that were conducive, particularly conducive to life. It's now generally admitted. So Stephen Hawking, you know, an atheist in his final book, said this. There are many features, he said, that seem to be tailor-made, features of the laws of physics that are, seem to be tailor-made for us to be here, and if they were slightly different, we wouldn't be. And he says, that coincidence is very hard to explain. He did explain it in something called uh, a multiverse idea, which I'll talk about in the Q&A, because we're running out of time. Um, well, um, anyway, but that's not generally admitted. Another interesting case of an anthropic coincidence is the size of the universe. Now, many people have seen the immensity of the universe as a sign that we're insignificant. If we're kind of the point of, or one of the points of it, why did God create those billions of light years of essentially empty space? Well, it turns out, if the laws of physics are as we know them to be, the universe has to be enormously large for us to be here, because we arose as a result of processes that took billions of years. First, the synthesis of the chemical elements, which took billions of years in stars, and then biological evolution. You need a universe to last billions of years. But for the, there's a relation in Einstein's theory of gravity. There's a relation between the longevity of the universe and its maximum size that it attains. If you said, I think God made the universe way too big, you know, it's ridiculous. He should have made a universe that was more like human scale, maybe a few thousand miles across. In that case, it would have lasted, the universe would not last more than a few thousandths of a second. Even if God had made a universe that was as big as the solar system, which is pretty big compared to us, it would only last a matter of hours. If you want the universe to last for billions of years, it has to be billions of light years across. So that, in a sense, is not a sign of our insignificance. What, what many have taken to be a sign of our insignificance is a precondition for us to be here. Um, as I said, there is a naturalistic way, which I actually think has a lot of merit to explaining many of these coincidences, which I think is called multiverse idea, which I take very seriously, and I think has some proof to it very likely. But I won't talk about that unless in the Q&A. Um, and the final thing, uh, well, the third thing, and then I'll, well, I have five minutes. A third development is that physicists have found, over the last century especially, that the universe is based on very deep mathematical ideas. The laws of planetary motion discovered by Kepler 400 years ago are very beautiful mathematically, but they're not that deep. They're based on very simple geometry and algebra, which you can teach a middle school student or even a sixth grader in 15 minutes to teach them Kepler's laws. The Kepler's laws, we now know, are really just a consequence of deeper laws. And those deeper laws are, are Newton's laws of mechanics and gravity. Now, to understand Newton's laws, you have to know calculus. But we now know that Newton's laws of mechanics and gravity are based on yet deeper laws. Quantum mechanics, in the case of mechanics, which is very difficult mathematically, and in the case of Newton's law of gravity, it's based on, it's really simply a consequence of an approximation to Einstein's theory of gravity. And to understand Einstein's theory of gravity, you have to know about curved, non-Euclidean, four-dimensional space-time. 
and tensor analysis and differential geometry and things that you ordinarily take an entire semester or two to learn in graduate school. But now it is widely believed in my field that Einstein's theory of gravity is an approximation to a yet deeper theory, which is very likely is something called superstring theory. That is so deep in mathematics. That even though what's called the superstring revolution happened in 1984, at which point thousands of the most brilliant mathematicians and mathematical physicists in the world started intensively studying superstring theory, so that's now more than 80 to 30 years ago, they still do not think that they understand the mathematics of it. It's, it's too deep. They haven't got their arms around the mathematical structure of the theory. So the deeper we have gone into nature, from Kepler to Newton to Einstein to uh, superstring theory and so on, the deeper the mathematical ideas that we encounter. And so that suggests to many people that um, the minds that work, I want to quote, uh, back actually in the early 20th century, a great physicist named James, Sir James Jeans remarked, the universe begins to look more like a great thought than a great machine. And in 1932, there's Einstein. In 1932, one of the great mathematicians of the 20th century, and also a very important mathematical physicist named Herman Weil, said this in a lecture at Yale University. He said, many people think that modern science is far removed from God. I find, on the contrary, that it is much more difficult today for the knowing person to approach God from history, from the spiritual side of the world, and from morals. But there we encounter the suffering and evil in the world, which it is difficult to bring into harmony with an all-merciful and almighty God. In this domain, we have evidently not yet succeeded in raising the veil with which our human nature covers the essence of things. But in our knowledge of physical nature, we have penetrated so far that we can obtain a vision of the flawless harmony, which is in conformity with sublime reason. And so the last thing I'm just going to mention is one of the greatest discoveries, maybe the greatest scientific discovery of the 20th century was the discovery of quantum mechanics. And that has several profound implications. And according to many smart people, including John von Neumann, Sir Rudolf Peierl, Sir Gene Wigner, if the logic of quantum mechanics implies that you cannot take a completely materialist view of reality, particular, if you try, if quantum mechanics is traditionally formulated, posits a physical systems that are measured or observed, and entities that measure and observe them, which are called traditionally the observer, observers. So you have the systems and you have observers. If you, systems are described by Schrodinger's equation, by, by differential equations, by the laws of physics. If you try to describe everything that goes on in a measurement, including the observer making the measurement, and try to describe everything with the equations of physics, you run into difficulties. And that's why Sir Rudolf Peierl, so I'll just quote a couple of famous physicists. Sir Rudolf Peierl, Rudolf Peierl a very famous physicist of the 20th century, said, the premise, and on the, because of quantum mechanics, he said, the premise that you can describe in terms of physics, the whole function of a human being, including its knowledge and consciousness, is untenable. And the Nobel Prize winner Eugene Wigner said, materialism, specifically the idea that human minds are just matter, emotion, is, quote, inconsistent with present quantum mechanics. And I'm quoting a philosopher here uh, from Princeton, a philosopher of science named Hans Halverson, who said, in the case of quantum mechanics, if one supposes presupposes physicalism, that is that everything is physical, uh, then one quickly lands in the measurement problem. So there is evidence, uh, there is an argument based on physics itself that not everything is physics. And so I end with this statement. Not only has Christianity, including the Catholic Church, was specific been a great friend of science and played a very positive role in its history. But the things discovered by science, contrary to what many people think, have actually in many ways tended to agree with things that we believe 
as Catholics about the universe and about ourselves. Thank you very much. Those are because of plate tectonics and so forth. 
which actually played an incredibly important role, I'm told by my friends who are astrobiologists and so on, that the fact that there are plate tectonics played a very important role in the development of the Earth and in making the Earth habitable uh, by living things. And so you can't take one without the other. You know, uh, uh, we don't like we don't like uh, various kinds of uh, bacteria, but they play a very important role in the world. Uh, and so you know. Uh, we now see how things are so interlinked that many of the things that we don't like are actually in sort of inherent, inevitable consequences of the way the world is set up and concomitants of other things that are very good in their, in their consequences. So, and actually, to the extent that science has discovered, the discoveries of science have not exacerbated the problem, in some sense, helped alleviate it, but that problem goes back thousands of years. Nothing. Why is there suffering evil? You know, Job asked it, why is there suffering? Job is asking that. An injustice long before anything resembling science existed. So that's that would be my answer to that as a scientist who's talking about faith and science. Yeah. Uh, James Holiday is noted for a lot of wonderful remarks, but the one that maybe is pertinent uh, here is he said universe may not be only stranger than we think. It may be stranger than we can. Right. The earth, the law of thermodynamics, can even exist in one percent of the system. And so there's a, temp there's a temptation to take all the things that are stranger than we can do and say, ah, it's got to be done. That's true. And that's what I was quoting these medieval uh, scientists like Bourdon and the resident as saying, don't jump to the conclusion that every strange thing is God. That's not the way Catholics historical. The primary evidence of God is not the inexplicable. First of all, as Catholics, you believe that in some sense everything makes sense. A lot of atheists think that religious people believe that ultimately things are irrational and don't make sense. Actually, we believe the opposite. We believe that everything makes sense. And, and if everything makes sense, then, then that's because it, everything was sort of the creation of a rational being. <laughs> uh, in fact, God is called. So in John's Gospel, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, Word translates Logos. In the beginning was Logos, and the Logos was with God, and, uh, and the Logos was God. The Logos equally means reason. And church writers from the very beginning of Christianity read that word as meaning both word and reason. And so we actually worship reason because another name for the Son of God, for the second person of the Trinity, is the Logos, is the divine reason. Which also, which stems actually from the Old Testament, where of the concept of the divine wisdom, and many of the later books of the Old Testament personify the divine wisdom as a being who is spoken of as being with God at the creation, as understanding everything that good, and as being spoken by God, wisdom comes forth from the mouth of the Most High. And, and that actually is fed into the Trinitarian thinking of the church. That's how the early church understood Christ to be the Logos, the divine wisdom. So, Yes, anyone who says, oh, there's stuff that doesn't make sense, it's God. Well, it's, evidence of God is not things that don't make sense. Evidence of God is that the world does make sense. It does make sense, and that's the evidence of God. Anyway, or at least, uh, and there's many things we can't make sense of, but of course, children can't always make sense of the things their adult, their parents do. And in comparison to God, one of my favorite verses is that, uh, that God says, as far above the, as far as the heavens are above the earth are my thoughts above your thoughts and my ways above your way. It's kind of arrogant to think that if there's an aspect of the world that doesn't make sense to us, that it doesn't make sense. Yes. 
we require entropy to decrease. Instead of entropy increasing, if you watch the universe, things are falling apart. Things don't build up. Building up means the entropy is decreasing. You can come to a place and see a mansion, but you can come to a place and see a mansion disintegrate. So evolution will require that entropy will be decreased. Okay, let me answer that because that's a, a common, yes. That's true, but it's also missing the point. You can have entropy decrease in one system as long as it increases elsewhere by more. So every time, if you put a glass of water into your freezer, the water, and it comes out, and it's all ice. Ice has lower entropy than water, because entropy is a measure of, a mathematical measure of physical disorder. And in water, the molecules are moving around randomly and are much more disordered than when they're in crystals of ice. So when you put the ice, the, the glass of water in your freezer, and leave it there, its entropy goes down. But what the second law doesn't, doesn't, doesn't forbid that. What it means is entropy has to increase somewhere else. And, and if you put your hand behind your refrigerator and feel all the hot air coming out the back, that's the entropy increasing in your kitchen. Now, why is that? In order to make, in some subsystem, the entropy decrease requires work. It requires a source of energy. You, you have to, if you want to cook, freeze the the water, you have to supply energy, which is why you have to plug your refrigerator into an electrical socket. So, you, in fact, evolution requires a source of energy, the sun. Without the sun, there's a big temperature difference between the sun and the surface of the earth. The sun's surface has 6,000 degrees. Kelvin, the earth is what, a few hundred? That temperature gradient allows you to drive evolution and life. You need a source of energy to have not only ev the evolution of life, but to sustain the living things themselves. This gets to the second law of thermodynamics. Ev entropy would tend to make us all disintegrate, as when we die, we do. We rot. We decompose. Why aren't we all just decomposing? Well, so we are slowly, those of us. <laughs> but why aren't we rapidly de decomposing? Because we just ate. In order to maintain the life of an organism against entropy, which wants to, to decompose that thing, you constantly have to supply the living thing with energy, which is why it has to eat. It has to hunt, it has to eat plants or other animals. You actually have to destroy that highly orderly, orderly structure called the uh, broccoli or whatever you're eating. You're taking some orderly food, which has lots of orderly uh, biochemical structure in it, eating it, and turning it into waste products, which have a lot less order, in order, in order to, to keep your bodily order from decomposing. So actually, the necessity of killing predation one creature eating another creature and killing it, whether it be a plant or another animal, is actually a feature of, this, of our world through the second law of thermodynamics. You've got to eat. So you're right that not only does evolution require certain things to decrease in entropy, but certain things, and, but life itself requires certain things to sort of swim upstream against, against the increase of entropy, but that doesn't violate the second law. To sustain one organism, its bodily structure, its orderly structure, you have to destroy the bodily structure and orderliness of other living things. Well, we That's a, the life, as they say, the death of the antelope is the life of the lion. I mean, we feel sorry for the antelope, but if you want a world with lions in it, you're going to have that antelope get eaten by lions. That's the way it works. But anyway, I don't want to get into this because no, no scientist that evolution is in conflict with the second law of thermodynamics. That is simply scientifically false. Hey, uh, one more last question. You mentioned the increase in mathematical difficulty going from Kepler to Newton to Einstein and Flushing Right. Do you think physics progress is sort of inevitably slow? 
slowing down because it's getting harder and harder? I think so. Uh, it is getting slow. It's getting slowing down. That, it, in fundamental physics, it's, it, it's the progress in other fields. Biology is, is going faster and faster. And in astrophysics, they're discovering all sorts of cool things all the time. In my field of particle physics, it is slowing down for two reasons. The experiments are getting harder to do because the phenomena you're talking about are, go, are, are happening at shorter and shorter distance scales. And as you go to shorter and shorter distance, you need more and more Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. You need uh, probes that, that, that make use of higher and higher energy, which is why particle physics is called high energy physics. So to study atoms, things at that light scale, you need energies of electron volts, which you can get with a battery. Um, and then but things at the uh, nuclear level, you need millions of electron volts. And then things at the, at the uh, electronic level, you need millions of electron volts. And at a certain point, it, it becomes actually impossible to build devices that will produce the sufficient energy to go to the distances we need to go in order to test things like superstring theory or brand unified theories and stuff. That's one thing. Also, the, the math is getting harder. And um, uh, that's somewhat counteracted by the fact that you have a lot of smart people. And, uh, and sometimes things that seem very hard, you know, a smart enough person, they, they solve it eventually. So, right there, well, let's uh, thank uh, Steve.